Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 174, we're going to talk about how to clean your connections for better sound. But before we get into the caution and everything, we're going to run a flash sale this weekend till Monday. And it's it was meant to be a PayPal flash sale. We actually have run out of cash in our PayPal account, and we use PayPal to buy... Um, Tubes, <laughs> <laughs> mainly. <laughs> well, I was going to say from, from uh, uh, people mostly in Europe and countries that are a long way away, PayPal is like the equivalent of a Swiss bank account. It's fabulous for many of those countries that have difficult banking. Anyways, um, we've bought a lot of tubes in the last two months. In fact, way more than we'll sell over the next couple of years probably. And you'll be seeing them come up periodically as they come in. Yeah, they so, started trickling in. We've got some to show you at the end of the show. So if you've got some PayPal bucks hanging around and you'd like to get 10% off your entire order, that is true, your entire order, including the kits, you can go ahead and use the code FLASH10. I'll, I'll show it again at the end of today's episode. And to be fair to everyone else, if you just got regular money, you can go through on the Stripe side and you can still grab the Flash 10. Yeah, it's not just for PayPal. Okay. So, first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now, improving your system can be as simple as making sure all your interconnects have low resistance connections. Low resistance just means that the connection doesn't impede the flow of electricity. And that means making sure your connections are snug and free of oxidation. Oxidation is the process in which metals react to oxygen in the air and produce an oxide layer. That can impede the flow of electricity. Now the oxide layer, we've always, I think everybody including me have always thought of the oxide layer as sort of like a fuzzy coating. But, mm -hmm. but in fact, it's actually the top layer of the metal as it's reacting to oxygen. It's, and we're overly simplifying things here for the, the sake of this video, but that's, uh, that's the gist of it. Yeah. So, and if you, and if your mind, in your mind, you still want to think of it as this fuzzy layer that must be dealt with, I think that's just fine because yeah. <laughs> it works. When I was a young audiophile back in the seventies, we were all plagued by equipment with cheap, poorly made RCA jacks with crappy metallurgy. And we're going to see some of those in a bit. <laughs> yep. And pretty much anything else that interconnected to something. So, we learned the hard way, if you didn't want a scratchy channel, or worse, have a channel drop out, always, just as you're about to dub your favorite record to tape, of course, you cleaned your interconnects on a regular basis. Now, standard operating procedure back in the day was once a month, you would disconnect everything and reconnect it a couple of times. And that mostly kept your system uh, nice and tight, uh, running running well without too many uh, connection problems. But once a year, we did a really big cleanup. And that was just the way everybody operated back then. Um, and these days, we have better metallurgy. And, you know, things have improved a lot since the 70s. But we still need to pay attention to this, or it will bite us in the butt just when we need our system to be performing at its best. And worse, if you're slowly getting resistance building up in your connections, your sound will be slowly degrading. Slowly changing over time. And you may not notice it. So let's, we're gonna take a look at the whole process. We're gonna do a whole bunch of cleanups as quickly as we can. So we're gonna move fairly quickly through it but it'll give you sort of an idea as to how the whole process looks. We've got a selection of tools here on the opening screen, and we're gonna bring them into play and show you how to use them. Okay, so let's start with something that everybody's got in their system, and that's RCA interconnect cables. So this, 
This is what a good cable will look like when it's brand new. Now this is a this is a custom cable. It'll, it's actually one of the um, prototypes that will become a kit cable uh, at some point near in the near future, and it's got a locking mechanism up here. You can see it's very bright, both on the center signal uh, post and where the ground connects, which is, let me go get my pointer. Pointing with a finger is very rude. You might want to bring that on the center there just to get it in focus. There we go. Ah, yeah. so there you go. So both the center post, which carries the signal, needs a good connection and around it is the ground or uh, shield. It actually performs both tasks. So the ground return path uses the shield and that that also uh, is just as important as the signal. Okay, so here is an older blue jeans cable. We used to actually use these in our entire system and they're, they've seen a lot of use. So they've seen commercial duty use and they're still in pretty good shape, but you can see it's really getting quite dull in there. So it could use a, uh, a cleanup. Now, the rule is the same as for the medical profession do no harm. Mm -hmm. So you go in lightly and then you build up to the, the bigger, more aggressive tools. So one of the simplest things you can use is um, a burner brush. This, that's what these little brushes are. They're used to clean gas burner rings. And this is a brass brush. And brass is wonderful because it will do a nice job of cutting oxide layers off and cleaning up small areas without really aggressively cutting too hard. Now, if you need to go hard, stainless is your is your tool. You cannot use a plain steel brush, never, ever, ever, because you're gonna leave a uh, little- Gonna gouge it, basically. And you're gonna leave bits of steel all over the place. And stainless will leave bits, and so will the brass. Brass is preferred for most jobs because most of your interconnects are brass underneath whatever the coating is. Mm -hmm. So and the coating won't be as strong as the underlying brass. Yeah, and usually what you're dealing with initially is just a, a tarnished coating that may be, you know, depending on the quality of the coating, it may be almost gone, in which case you're gonna be basically cleaning up brass. So a simple procedure would be just to get in there and just carefully. Now, whenever you're working with something that's got little wires you need to wear eye protection and you need to be really careful that you don't stick yourself because and in a few seconds you can see let me get it right up close you can see i'm already starting to brighten it up now of course you're going to go around now what do you do about areas you can't get into well when i was a young lad cleaning equipment this is all we had <laughs> And so we would peel these things back and make them smaller and, oh God, it was awful. So nowadays there's all kinds of really, um, I, I wanted to call it high tech, but this is not high tech. More purpose built. More purpose built. Thanks, Charles. Hmm. Uh, tools. So if you can't get into here with your brush conveniently or without making a real mess of things, what you want is something, a contact cleaner like Deoxit, this stuff. This is the D100L. This is the... Sort of the gold standard contact cleaner, but there's lots of other types out there. Lots of other types. This is the full concentrate. It's not the spray stuff. I much prefer using it. It's very, very expensive, even from our wholesaler. But, but you don't need a lot of it, thankfully. You do not need a lot. I'm going to show you just once how to use it, and, and then you'll know what you're up. So I'm going to try not to make a mess here. You just put a drop on a cleaning tool like this. And you're just going to come in here and you're just going to apply it. Just make sure you've got a good layer applied. You do not, if you've got so much in here, it's dripping. You've put way too much of this expensive stuff. And show how, what's on the Q-tip there. Now, go off and um, play some music, grab a coffee, <laughs> whatever you want to do, and let the deoxid do its job. And then you come back and you get in there and you just clean that up. Now, if you've got a bunch to clean up, you'll have a working um, tool like that. And then you'll come by 
with a nice clean one as a follow-up. And you'll just do this. You can leave a little bit of deoxid in there and it'll, it'll actually, in fact, it's probably preferable that there's a small layer of deoxid on that surface. It'll help protect it and it'll help improve the contacts, but it, each to his own. Once you've got the metal surface cleaned, you're golden, right? Okay, so that's, that's um, RCA interconnects. What's next? Okay, now this is a piece of audio history. <laughs> this is a quad Dolby B processor unit uh, for my tape system, and it's in the shop in our in our lab for, for rebuilding. Rebuild, yeah, and and let me see if I can get these angles so you can see better how bad they are. The this is this is what we lived with. I know. The 70s were terrible for interconnects. Yeah, look how dull these look here. This is how it came in. Now, depending on how they clean up, I will either clean them up and g check the resistance. I'll get an ohm meter on them and I'll check. We have a really high definition ohm meter that'll let us know um, down to a fraction of an ohm how yep. we're doing. Um, so if I can do that, I will clean them up. That's always my first choice is to save things in um, vintage equipment if I can. If I can't though, I'll replace them with something better and newer, but it's a fairly big job to desolder all of these. There's 16 of them in total, I think. Um, so how would you go about that? Well, you can come at it with certainly some of the outside work with one of these abrasive wheels in a Dremel. Or maybe one of the wire versions of the same thing. Yeah, in fact, hang on to that thing. Um, we actually have a lot of these. These are dangerous, um, but they're extremely effective and they're not expensive. So if, if you promise to wear eye protection and clean up afterwards, and you'd like to try these in your Dremel, we have lots of them. So. If you put an order in this weekend and take advantage of the discount code, um, just put a note on the order and say, I'd love to try one of these for free. We'll throw one in the box. Just be responsible when you're using them. You, these little guys, they fly off everywhere. Whereas the these are much more expensive, but um, uh, they, they don't tend to fly off. I would still recommend eye protection. Yeah, if you're doing this a lot, you can actually buy these guys as a kit. They're available on Amazon, AliExpress, all over the place. Yep. They're, they're great tools. So I would recommend these highly. Um, they don't cut as aggressively as the brass wheel, obviously, uh, but they still work really good. So you could use this. You could use the deoxid. Now, a last resort always is to bring in a very fine black paper and these papers are designed for cutting metals and you would start with something quite fine let's say something like a 600 grit and if that's not working uh, you would go uh, a little bit coarser to maybe 400 grit now you these come in big sheets obviously so depending on what you need you actually cut it roll it if you need to fold it if you need to into the tool that you're going to use. So you might do this. And if you're working on a piece of equipment and you don't want to damage the finish, and you don't, <laughs> get some painter's tape. This is wide stuff. You can get it in thinner stuff. And go ahead and make a protective uh, layer so that you don't damage anything you're working on. I would say that any kind of abrasive paper like this is an absolute last resort. Work your way through the safer methods of cleaning up contacts. And if all else fails, then you can abrade the surface. And also you should check to see um, if you've got a ferrous or non-ferrous metal. Now that's ferrous. This is a nice big strong magnet. These screwdrivers are fabulous. We actually have them in the store. Um, and for this, you know, I only we only carry tools in the store that are dedicated to working on tube gear and cleaning tube gear and stuff like and, that. And tools that we like. <laughs> and tools that we really like. So this is really handy and it's, it's built that way. Of course, pick stuff up, but this is, this is not ferrous right here. So that's great. So we know 
that that's going to have to be something like a brass alloy or aluminum. And it's highly unlikely it's aluminum, so it's probably brass with a zinc coating on it. And once we clean it up, it'll probably polish up perfectly. And I already showed you how to clean the center contact using deoxit. So this probably will clean up perfectly and we'll be able to save the jacks. Okay, what's next, Charles? Okay, well, what about speaker cables? What about... Um, this is a, an older style banana jack, and it's a great style. Uh, these are on um, some, what's the cable type that we've got here? Oh, uh, well, they're Lynn cables, but I don't remember the exact version. Yeah. They're uh, K20s. Yeah. yeah, and I think these are, are Lynn's, the, these bananas. Anyways, uh, you would deal with these in a very similar fashion now as to the other things that we dealt with. Now, we're always in a hurry because there's so much work to do on the bench. We would probably bring in one of the finer grits. The, the wire wheels come in grits all the way up to 600 I think or something. It's 80 to 600 they, co they come in. Yeah, so yeah. you never ever, in fact, we've never used the 80 wheel, I don't think. No, it's way too aggressive. <laughs> so we'd probably come in with a 600 wheel. Um, but if you don't want to use a Dremel, something like a brass brush, would do an amazing job of cleaning this up. It doesn't take very long either. No, in fact, you can see it's already, let me get it on camera here, so it's already starting to brighten up. A, um, a nice clean cloth like this with a little bit of 99% isopropyl would be fabulous for wiping this off. In fact, um, isopropyl alcohol, I've got some on the bed. Oh, that's a stupid thing to say. We have <laughs> isopropyl everywhere and all on all of our benches but this is what we're talking about 99 percent pure you can get them at your local drugstore um, they're used by healthcare workers the world over you don't want uh, the, uh 70 percent stuff whoa, whoa. and you don't want rubbing alcohol for goodness sake no it's got additives in it okay so that's easy peasy remember if you've got a really high quality connection and it's gold plated you want to go at that very, very gently. So you may just start with some isopropyl alcohol on a nice clean cloth like this that's got a little tiny bit of a bite and will really do a good job cleaning the surface. If that isn't doing it, you might go to something like a nylon brush. Just the next step down from the brass one. So this is really a, a very light, low aggressive method and you could even put a little drop of isopropyl on and use that to work at it um, now what if you're running if you're running lugs it's going to be fairly similar to cleaning up the lug surface lugs will oxidize quite readily it, it's just in the nature of the beast so you'll be dealing with them similarly to these what if you've got bare copper a lot of people run bare copper um, Years ago, that's all we ever did was run bare copper. So this is the other end of the cable. And that is a clean strip. You see how nice and bright that is? That is going to be 100% contactable. <laughs> did I make up a new word? Maybe. So what's going to happen here is ideally this should be tinned, in my opinion. But some people don't like to tin uh, their wire and some people don't have uh, benches with good soldering irons or don't, don't trust themselves around a soldering iron and that's fine you can stay with bare copper but what you're probably going to want to do if you've got lots of cable is just cut it back hang on a second I've got my stripper here somewhere Charles ah, ah, there we are everything is within reach on a, a good electrical bench so you would just cut it back to a clean spot this is only if you've got lots of cable available. Another good reason for always having a longer length than what you actually need. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, even when we build um, the interconnections inside the kit amps, we always show people how to make a long sweeping connection. Yeah, we want to have as short a run as possible, but practically. Yeah. So we always have extra uh, wire inside it an amp chassis so that later on if there's a repair and that's it you're good 
And if you have really old speaker cable, you may have to go back four inches to find a good, clean, non-oxidized bit of copper. Yeah, that oxide will, will creep up underneath the, um, underneath the uh, PVC. Yep, it does. It creeps. Now, if you don't have a lot of extra cable, what can you do? Well, you can come in and you can just simply clean it up with a brush. It won't be as good because the oxide layers on multi-strand will be all over the place. And of course, you can't open this up uh, or eventually you'll fatigue the wire and you'll make a mess of things. But this would be at least a good compromise. You can always chemically treat um, all of these connections we've been talking about with deoxid and it'll do a great job of helping clean things up. My personal preference is if I can lightly abrade something rather than using a chemical, I would prefer to do it that way. But there's nothing wrong with uh, using a chemical treatment or even relying on a little thin layer of deoxid to maintain a good contact layer. That's absolutely fine. It's not really for me, but um, a lot of people will use deoxid as sort of pre a preventative. Yeah. Okay, what's next, Charles? Okay, so next we're going to take a look at tube sockets and tubes themselves. With the sockets, pretty much your only option is going to be using something like deoxid to get in there. It's just too tight of a, uh, of a fit. So you could use something like one of these specialized tools and just a little dab of deoxid get into all these tight spots and clean it out just like with the RCA jacks. And same for the octals. These aren't as bad though because you can see they have a sort of blade design that's designed to almost cut into the tube pins and get a good connection. It almost it almost renews its connection surface every time. So mm -hmm. it that's obvious. These actually, we use these in all of our kits that need an octal socket, and they're fabulous. I don't think anybody's ever had a problem with them. Oh, they've been really good. And for two pins, here's an example of a 6N1P, not the EV, because they actually have tin pins where we've got some oxidation on here. And with these, our favorite tool to use, of course, is the Dremel with one of these. I think they're made of nylon, these nylon brushes here. Abrasive, yeah. Yeah, or the brass version of the same thing. They make really quick work of it. Same with the octal tube. Or you can go in there with a standard hand brush and just attack it with that. And that, this is how we started cleaning these until, you know, whenever you have 100 tubes to do, the Dremel's a little bit faster. <laughs> so you can get in there real quick. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. And this one is actually, I, I went through the bin and I found the worst example of pins I could find for an octal. So this one's actually gonna take a bit to clean up. Yeah, now what are you gonna do, Charles, if the back of the pin where you can't get ah. the brush in is really bad? Well, we're gonna use one of our favorite tools. This gets so much use. We have a couple of these on each of our benches and they, these are fantastic little utility knives. What you wanna do is get in, let me get this on camera, and using sort of the a backstroke, you want to scrape. And scraping is going to fully abrade that layer. And you're going to get, you can see shiny metal in there, hopefully. And you'll get a good connection. Yeah, now obviously if you have gold-plated pins and the gold is mostly in good shape... You don't want to be aggressive with it. The only thing that will that you could use is a nylon brush very, very gently. You could use a, a cloth with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Or a little bit of deoxid as well. Yeah, and actually there's a deoxid gold, I think, that might be more appropriate for that. There's a whole series of deoxids, which will bankrupt you if you buy them all. <laughs> um, but it is a very good product. All right, so that's the tubes. What's next? Okay, what about XLRs? Now, this is a standard 3-pin XLR. In fact, this is a Nutrik, and these are fabulous. And, of course, these are brand new, um, and they're not cheap connectors. But what if you have an older uh, XLR or a mini XLR? Um, it's been pulled around on a few gigs, dragged through some smoky bars. <laughs> uh, yeah and has some stories to tell as a result, um, you're going to have 
a hard time getting in with almost any of the tools. And that's where these little guys, or I think I have for a standard XLR, you would probably use something like this guy. A little bit bigger, yep. At least for these pins. And you put a little deoxid on the tip. And in fact, I think we have enough. Do we have enough time for another demonstration, Charles? <laughs> Maybe, but it's not going to do too much to these brand new connectors. Let's... No. So you would just get in here like this. Let me get you on camera. And you just work around, apply your deoxid. Take a break once you've got it well coated and then you can come back with a clean one and you can just work it all uh, until, and you'll see the oxide will come on to your pad. These white pads are fabulous for that, showing you uh, what's going on. And for the, the other end. smaller connections in the other end, same thing, you put a dab of deoxid on this and you just come in gently and you just work it and then leave it and let it, Letting the deoxid do its work is great. You don't have to do anything. You can go and have a coffee, listen to some music, and then come back and do a little bit more work to get that last oxide layer off. And as I mentioned before, you can leave a little thin layer of deoxid in place, and it'll actually help, help with the maintenance of a good connection. Okay, now, what are some of the key points we want you to keep in mind? Number, what's number one? Do oh. no harm. Yeah. So most of us have invested a lot of money in our interconnects and you don't want to damage them. So you start with the least aggressive method possible. Yeah, you pretend this is an old painting that you're trying to restore. You don't want to damage the paint and you just want to remove the junk that's on top of it. Right. And then you step up your game as when you realize that you're gonna need something a little bit more aggressive. So you don't go from zero to 100 mm -hmm. in three seconds. Don't pull out the angle grinder. You don't need it. <laughs> well, the big wire wheel on the on your Makita angle. <laughs> yeah, that's aggressive. Oh my God. That could take your whole hand off if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, step by step, take your time. And when I'm doing bench work, one of the techniques that I've learned over the years that has served me extremely well is to stop, to pause periodically and have a look at what you're actually doing. Yeah. And if you like what you're doing, you keep going. And if you say, huh, I'm not sure if this is doing what I want it to do. Well, you don't keep going. <laughs> no, think about it for a bit and see if you can find a better way. That's right. Go have a coffee and something will, or a walk around the block and something will always occur to you. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, hopefully that helps everybody have better sound in their system for just a small amount of work. All right, now let's take a look at what came in. Wow. Okay, Charles, what's, what's next? Okay, so we have some of these absolutely beautiful 6SN7 equivalents in a 9-pin bottle. These are Hitachi 6GU7s and Matsushita 6CG7s. And it's tough to find Japanese-made tool, tubes. I was going to say tools. <laughs> it's actually quite easy to find Makita tools in North America, but not Japanese-made uh, tubes. But they made some wonderful tubes. And they did. And a few of our customers recently bought out all the 6CG7s that we had of these. They said... These are some of the best sounding 6SN7 equivalents out there. And how can it be an equivalent? Well, you just need to use one of these great 9-pinned octal adapters that we get from Amptata. They're a well-known adapter and socket saver maker. Yeah, the gentleman who runs the factory uh, has just been fabulous. Whenever we have a spec uh, change that we need because uh, we feel that he could make a small improvement for our customers. He's like, yep, no problem, Jim. Next, next order, I'll, I'll, I'll make that improvement for you. We're always looking for nice, tight, snug um, pins on our socket savers and adapters. And he actually manufactures his adapters uh, for the general public fairly loose just because he gets so many complaints when they're snug. <laughs> and I said, well, our customers are mostly audiophiles and they don't want loose pins. They want a solid connection, yeah. Yeah, so, so he specially makes them tight for us. Yeah, so these are great. Um, they adapt more than just these tubes too, if you're looking for something else. And 
For the 60 G7s, we have a couple more pairs in, more on the way, thankfully, we were able to find some more. And we've gotten in some more 6 GU7s as well, and of course there's more of them coming too. Yeah, I mean, I love them all as subs for the 6SN7. Now, they're not 6SN7s. They have this unique sound that is very clean, clear, and open. Yeah. They, they just have huge amounts of detail, very, very low noise. It's rare to find these tubes with uh, with a noisy plate on them. But like everything in audio, there's a trade-off. So yep. the 6SN7 is probably the warmest sounding twin triode ever made. And mm -hmm. it's probably why it's one of the most loved tubes in audio. But that warmth comes from a second harmonic distortion, which is going to mask some detail. So it's usually a trade-off, detail and warmth, warmth and detail, and we've heard that these 60 G7s actually bring some of that warmth back in along with the detail, so... A small amount. Yeah, so it's a nice balance, we've heard. Okay, what's next, Charles? Well, we've got a lot of power tubes, and in fact, it's one of the reasons why we're, we're out of PayPal money, is power tubes cost vintage, good quality vintage power tubes cost a lot of money, uh, even wholesale. Um, what have you got here, Charles? All right, well, let's start off with our, our old favorite, the RFT EL34s. We've been getting in some great used and new old stock versions of these, and some with some fantastic labels. Uh, of course, these were rebranded for pretty much everybody, including Telefunken, so you get some of these great Telefunken labels on there. But it's not possible normally to have a complete match set of labels. What we do is we focus on matching tube type, tube emissions, which is mm -hmm. the number you're seeing here, and, and and lastly, we work on matching aesthetics. If we can find match labels, we'll do it, but you know, how the tube is performing is really what's most important here. And you'll see we've got some with Siemens labels on it. There's That one's faded a little bit, but not too bad. And then we actually have an original RFT labeled one, which is quite nice. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, the rarest of the labels are the RFT labels. <laughs> yeah, they, they tended to do a lot of rebranding for everybody else. You'll see them for AEG, Siemens, Telefunken. Um, oh, you name it. Yeah. Almost everybody. And we have three favorite vintage EL34s. We have the, Mul the, the Mullard XF2s. Not very many people can afford to run XF2s. Um, and then we've got two close, um, uh, second places, <laughs> second places, the Svetlana EL34, the classic St. Petersburg version and the RFT EL34. Yeah. And they both have their own sonics. The RFTs have a very clean, clear sound, uh, uh probably the, the best lowest distortion tube. It competes favorably on that, uh, uh, in that area with the XF2 Mullards. And the Svetlana is very, a very different tube. It's a very warm, rich sounding tube, but you, with, with that warmth, you give up some of the detail, of course. Mm -hmm. What else have we got? Well, we didn't actually get these tubes in new. What we did is we went through our bin of 45 tubes because we haven't been in there in a while and we matched up some new pairs and we found actually a uh, couple of pairs. One of them is a uh, US made Westinghouse. And look at these beautiful directly heated power triodes. These are. Now we're, we're going back to the 1930s and 40s here, right? Yeah, yeah. These are beautiful old power tubes. Look at the size of the plate on that power tube. And if you look at these tubes from the top down when you're running them on the in your amp or on a tester, yeah, like that. they actually string a pair of filaments. Um, and it's the coolest thing in the world. It, it looks like sort of a, like a, a tent structure inside of there. Well, you have to remember too, the filaments were the cathode on these directly heated tubes. So they needed that extra surface area and right. current handling capability. Right. And we also found amazingly a pair of tongue saws. Now these are rebranded. I think this one is actually, yeah, it's branding is sort of worn off here. But these are, you can tell by the construction, these were made by Tung Sol. They have these metal tines that was uh, typical of their construction of these tubes at the time. And, you and know, I can't they, tell you how difficult it is to find modern, or not modern, but later production Tung Sol tubes. Uh, a 45 though? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's tough to find tubes that were 
were made in the 60s and 70s. So to find one that these were probably made sometime in the 1940s because they're in really good condition. Uh, but dating these things is a is really not easy. Uh, and I don't know if anybody alive is an expert on the 45. I don't know. And, and these are actually testing right at new old stock too. New old stock is 40 milliamps and these are testing right around 38. So they are fantastic tubes. I think you've got them in the stores that use tubes though and, pri yeah. and priced like that. Well, we don't have the boxes for them, obviously. So Our rule of thumb is if we're not 100% sure that it's new old stock, then it goes in as used. It goes in as used. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you stayed till the very end, and I'm sorry, it was it was a really long episode, but we had a lot to do. Um, and here is your flash discount code. Just put in flash ten, and you'll get ten percent off everything in the store, including the kit amps. And if you find something in the store that's actually already on sale, well, you get that sale price and you get 10% off on top of it. <laughs> so, um, oh, he almost breaks the tubes. I'm sure they're just fine. <laughs> Anyways, um, the sale is going to run till Monday, February, the end of the day, Monday, February the 26th. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.